Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all to our March 1st, 2021 Warren County Board of Commissioners regular business meeting. If you choose to do so, I ask that we stand for a moment of silence, a prayer, and the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, we come to you to this day asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion, allow us to grow closer as a group and as a, as a community. Fill us with your grace, Lord God, as we make decisions that might affect the citizens of Warren County. And continue to remind us that, that we are here today to do all of your will and not ours. In this pursuit of truth and greater glory of you, Lord God, we ask you that we look after the needs of humanity here within the, the confounds of Warren County and outside. We ask these things in your name, amen. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, we have had a lot of people throughout the country who have been victims of COVID-19. And some of them are definitely in the boundaries of Warren County. And I ask that we just have an additional moment of silence for them, please. Thank you for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, and um, I hear an echo. You see, we have a uh, considerable amount of things on our agenda tonight to, to discuss, and we'll get right back and go ahead and get into it. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I entertain a motion um, to adopt I'll suggest that the agenda, which is item number one. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Baker, that we adopt our suggested agenda. Is there any discussion? Here, none. All in favor say aye. Opposed, right. nay. Motion is carried. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, we'll be discussing item number two, which is our um, conduct our public hearing. And our public hearing is consists of proposed text amendments to the Warren County Zoning Ordinance. And there's um, this is to maintain the setbacks in um, LB, NB, HB, L, um, I, H, I, and districts are currently stated under the uh, PUD CR condition use permit uh, provision established and required setbacks of 75 feet from all exterior properties. Um, we're going to go right into this public hearing. And Ms. Pulley, do we have any sign ups? Okay. Um, I would like to, we, well, we're, we're just here from Mr. Joe Johnson, then we'll get into some discussion. Mr. Johnson, you may come to the podium, please, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Joe Johnson. Uh, with reference to uh, this particular item, uh, I've reviewed it, uh, and uh, in my opinion, I think it needs to be reviewed additionally. Uh, I have had uh, some discussion uh, with Mr. Pruitt. Uh, I'll let him address his comment. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Um, So 
since Mr. Johnson was actually the um, the only person that signed up for it, is okay with the Board of Commissioners. I'd like for Mr. Uh, call Mr. Um, Krulik up for a little backdrop on what this is actually consists of. So Mr. Krulik, please. Thank you. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, this is actually um, sort of a follow up hearing. The last time that we met regarding this issue was on the height requirements, the height changes within the lakeside business and the commercial districts. Uh, and then it tied to that was a recommendation that came from the planning board with regards to adjusting the setbacks. So basically, the setbacks would stay the same in the lakeside business, heavy business, and our industrial districts with the provision that would be changed in the conditional use permit for a PUD CR, which is our mixed use option, requiring a 75 foot setback from all the exterior property lines. Uh, within your packets, I believe that I did submit also a graphic. Uh, if you could pull that up, Paula. So basically what I wanted to show is, you know, visually the difference between a setback and what we have is our vegetative buffers. So currently you can see where the exterior property lines are and then currently within our commercial districts there's a required 50 foot setback, which means that no structures can be built any closer than 50 feet to the property line. It doesn't include parking lots, doesn't include driveways, doesn't include sidewalks, the actual physical structure. And then currently within that setback, you see where the green is, we have what's required a 20 foot vegetative buffer. Uh, try to maintain it as being a natural buffer or replanting by any development. And that buffer is required in next to incompatible land uses. So if you have commercial businesses next to residential, there's that requirement for a buffer. And again, the ordinance currently has 20 foot minimum. So if you then think about what's proposed from the planning board of increasing that setback to 75 feet, it would be a greater distance that would go back to the uh, property line to any, the nearest structure. And in relation to uh, Mr. Johnson's uh, proposal, there has been a uh, further request from the Eaton's Ferry Estate subdivision with regards to HUD CR and Lakeside Business Districts that there be an increase to a 100 feet, but then also increasing the buffer to 50 foot vegetative. Um, realistically, the commissioners, you have the choice to adopt what has been proposed by the planning board. You could recommend it goes back to the planning board for further review. If there was a minor tweaking of say the setback issue, that's not a problem for the board to consider. But anytime you get into more depth of changing the language and the text, procedurally what has historically been done from this board is to send it back to the planning board for further review and further work. And then make a recommendation that goes back to this board for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Crewley. And, and, and I've had some opportunity to look at this and um, I think there are some, some things in here that kind of bother me, uh, well, I say bother, but maybe concern me about the setbacks and, and especially the buffers, buffers when it comes to uh, um, how commercial and residential kind of like coincide with each other. And um, uh, I just think that there's no need to rush this thing, but I think that the uh, planning board should be able to basically see this information before we take a take a decision on it. So um, if any other commissioner have anything to say about it, but I, I would just ask, it'd be my request and ask that you go along that we send this back to the planning board and let them at least look at the uh, re request that's been given um, to basically look at it and see if this was best for this area. So that, that'll be my request. So, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, at this point, I'm not ready to vote on it personally. I don't know how the other commissioners feel. So, uh, I, I don't know if we need a formal vote to, to send this back to the yes, planning sir. board or, or that might be more appropriate than tabling it at this time. So, uh, can we do this with the general consensus? Uh, should I offer a motion to refer this back to 
the committee for if, further, further review. If this is different than what came prior from the planning board, it has to go back to the planning board. Okay. So okay. Okay. It has to go either yeah. way. Yeah, it normally it comes through the planning board to right. you okay. guys. So if it hasn't been to the planning board, it needs to go. Okay. okay. So that's yeah. Thank you. So by consensus, well, by through procedure, it goes back anyway. All right. So um, unless any other commissioner has anything else to say about it, then we'll let that rest where it is that it returns back to the planning board for more consideration. I just got a quick question. So why was it brought to us first then instead of going back to you know, just have it taken off the agenda. If it was going to be something that needed to go back through the planning board, why did it get added to the agenda? Is my question. Well, it came before this board for in the actual hearing that we're in right now. So certainly this board can take action to send it back to the planning board for further review. Go ahead, Mr. Jones. Uh, what you all are sending back to the planning board is you have received a new proposal from the neighbors right. and that is what needs to be considered by the planning board so so thank you thank you mr jones all right so uh mr commissioner pierce you have anything else no i just want to make sure that this is you know what was agreed on by the subdivisions because what I don't kind of want to see happen is so this is the request that's being sent back to the committee and then they you know do their adjustment make the recommendation coming back to the board and then there's another adjustment that's made you know what I'm saying so if there's any concern that would just simply be my suggestion if there's any additional um, updates that are to be made if it could be done I guess given to the committee correct yes yes public. Yeah. Right. The planning board would actually the planning board would actually work on an appropriate response or an appropriate text provision to make the amendment. So that's what their role is: is to amend the ordinance based upon what is being submitted. Great. Okay, Mr. Crew, they don't meet again until next month, correct? So, sir, the planning board doesn't meet until next month, correct? Correct. The earliest they would meet would be the first Tuesday. Generally, by the bylaws, they meet the first Tuesday of the month, so their next one potentially wouldn't be until April. So, whatever the first Tuesday in April would be. Okay. So at least by May, we should see this again in, in, the, Correct. in the final, final process. Thank you. That, I, that I will say ideally that you would see it by May. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll entertain a motion that we close, uh, conclude the uh, public hearing for this proposed uh, text amendment. Uh, to close the public hearing. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Baker, second by Commissioner Power, that we conclude our um, public hearing on proposed text. Is there any further discussion? Hear none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. We are hereby concluded our public hearing. We're gonna, uh, if it's okay with you all, the, the board here, we'll move right on to item number three, which is the physical, physical year 20 audit report. And that is gonna be put on by Ms. Robinson, which is uh, by Zoom. So I'll turn it over to the county manager. Thank you, Chair. As you know, we every year are required to uh, complete our annual comprehensive financial audit. And Ms. Robertson with Winston Williams, Creech and Evans, uh, they are our auditors of record. And uh, with the pandemic, it has taken us a while. We've had some transition in the office, but uh, we have been able to complete our audit. And Ms. Robertson is here to give you a update this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I believe that Someone's going to project the presentation for those there. Okay. That's correct. You're all set. Okay. Um, so for June 30, 2020, 
Warren County has received a unmodified opinion on their financial statements. Um, this is the best opinion that you can receive for the financial part of your financial statements. Um, basically, that means that no material misstatements were found in those statements. And that's the next slide. Okay. Next slide. All right, on the statement of net position, this is the government wide statement. Total assets for the county increased to $78 million, which is an increase of $2.8 million over 2019. This increase is primarily made up of $3.9 million increase in cash and a decrease in the capital assets of $1 million. And that decrease in the capital assets is mainly made up of depreciation of those assets. The total liabilities for the county increased to $27.3 million, which is only a $200,000 increase over 2019, and that's mainly due to current payables and accrued liabilities. The deferred outflows decreased to $2.6 million and the deferred inflows increased to half a million dollars. And both of those deferred inflows and outflows are primarily related to the pensions. Um, so this is um, related to market timing and the valuations of the pension assets and um, the liabilities of paying out those pensions in the future. So the net position for the county increased to $52.9 million. That's a $1.9 million increase over last year, which is a great thing um, with the pandemic and the, the care that was taken in saving money when people were staying home and trying not to spend a lot of money um, during the recession towards the end of the fiscal year and things like that and sales tax revenues being slightly down and things like that. Next slide. For the statement of activities, revenues were actually up in 2020. They were up by about $700,000 to $37,452,540. The expenditures were also up to $35,510,166. That's an increase of about $682,000. That's how we get to the increase in net position of $1.9 million. You can see that we also had an increase in net position for 2019 of $1.9 million but it was just slightly higher in 2020, about $24,000 higher. Next slide shows the cash for the county. In 2019, it was $19.6 million. In 2020, the cash for the county was $23.5 million, an increase of $3.9 million. The governmental fund revenues, the largest pieces of that pie are ad valorem taxes coming in at 65%, restricted governmental revenues. This is grant funding and money that comes from other governmental agencies at 15% and sales tax revenue at 12%. Those three categories make up 92% of the governmental revenues for the county. Governmental fund expenditures, the largest is public safety coming in at 31%. Human services at 27%, education at 17%, and general government at 14%. Those four functions account for 89% of the expenditures for the county. 
in the governmental area. The general fund revenues were originally budgeted at $31 million. There were just a few budget amendments that increased that to $31.1 million. And you actually came in at just under that at $30 million.9. Um, so just slightly under budget for the year. For the general fund expenditures, you started out the budget year with a budget of $31.8 million. And after all budget amendments had been made, it was $32.2 million. And you finished the year at $28.5 million, which is great. You came in significantly under budget through controlled spending and um, deferring some expenditures. Um, and efforts made to control costs. The budget at the beginning of the year planned for y'all to use some fund balance. Um, you had planned to use approximately $800,000. Your budget amendments had y'all using $1.1 million. In actuality, you did not use any fund balance and actually contributed to your fund balance. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that your beginning fund balance was $13.5 million and your ending fund balance was $15.9 million, an increase to the general fund of $2.4 million, a great increase to your fund balance. On the next slide, um, we see a statistic that is used by the local government commission in rating counties health um, and their standing amongst other counties and their ability to borrow funds. In 2019, your general fund balance available for appropriation as a percentage of expenditures was just under 42%. In 2020, you had increased this by 10 percentage points to just under 52%. The state publishes um, every year the averages by population group. You're in the population group of counties with a population of 25,000 people or less. There are 25 counties in this population group. And the average for fiscal year 2019 for that population group was 33.14. So you are well above the average for your peer group. And to put that into some more context, out of those 25 counties, the range for that statistic started at 11% and went up to 84%. So you're well within the middle of the pack, but still well above the average of those 25 counties, which is a great thing. Your general fund debt in both categories for bonds and installment purchases was paid down. You have $61,000 in bonds and you have $6,070,000 outstanding in installment purchases. Now we're moving to your proprietary funds. <clears throat> For your water funds, you had operating revenues of $3.4 million and expenses of 3.2, giving you an operating income of just over $200,000. However, you had non-operating expenses of just shy of $400,000. Those non-operating expenses are primarily debt service costs. So it's your interest expense. You did have some capital contributions of just over $400,000. So thank goodness they covered your non-operating expenses and you had some negligible transfers of $3,745. So you did have a change in net position of $294,000.
for solid waste, you had operating revenues of 1.8 million and operating expenses of 1.7. So you had operating income of 65,000. Your non-operating expenses were $1,100 and you had capital contributions of 58,000 and some transfers of $1,000 for a change in net position of $126,000. So overall for your proprietary funds, they increased their net position by $420,000. For your proprietary debt, they are also paying down their debt. Their um, bonds have decreased to $11.6 million and their installment purchases have decreased to $793,000. Now your tax collection percentages. Um, this graph looks very deceptive. So please pay attention to these numbers very closely because that is not that big of a gap. Um, in 2019, you were at 97.24%. And in 2020, you're at 96.74. So that is only half a percentage point. Um, it looks like a big gap, but that is only 0.5 percentage point. And then your peer group is at 97.29. So you're really only half a percentage point from the average of those 25 counties. And then compliance. Um, I know last year we talked quite a bit about um, the Medicaid audit. Um, so just an update on that. Um, we again tested 101 cases out of 46 of those claims, 87 errors were found. There were some costs that were paid to ineligible participants that totaled $1,400. I do want to state that there was improvement from 2019. So even though this looks like a lot, a reminder from last year, the errors were over 100. So there is improvement from 2019, but there is still room for continued improvement. So I do recognize the county on the efforts that they've made since last year. And I do think that they will continue to make more improvements, um, but I do want to recognize them for the efforts that they have made to this point. Um, and I would like to extend a thank you to everybody in the finance department, um, to Kathy, even though she's already gone, but she was a big help to Mr. Faines, um, to Mr. Jones, to everybody that has helped us to finish this audit and to get it done. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Ms. Robinson, I really do appreciate the, uh, the audit, professional audit that you've given us. Um, there are a few things that um, that I, I wish you would have said or how wonderful a job that we are doing on this end uh, based upon all the other audits that you do across the state. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, you got a clean opinion. That is a great thing. <laughs> That's the best you can do. I, I didn't want to say it myself, but it sounds so much better when it's coming from smart. <laughs> I mean, there, there's nothing better that you can do than to get an unmodified opinion. That's the best of the best. Best of the best. And I uh, really do appreciate your, your, your time. Uh, however, I would like to open it up to any commissioners that may have questions for you, if you don't mind, okay? So, uh, commissioners, is there anything that someone would like to ask or comment for Ms. Robinson while we have her here? Okay, I think we, we're good to go. Um, but I would like to say that to uh, Ms., Mr. Jones uh, and, and to this board, uh, this speaks to the leadership of this board, each commissioner here, and it also it speaks to the leadership of our administrative staff headed up by Mr. Jones, that we have these type of numbers that sets us up for the, the challenges and the things that we face for the betterment of the people of Warren County. It really puts us in a good position 
And I want to say job well done to every, everyone here, and I appreciate it. So uh, I'm going to conclude with uh, Ms. Robinson, thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Jones if he has anything. And but from there, thank you, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Chair. I don't have uh, much additional to add um, at this point. Uh, we appreciate the work of the finance team, uh, including Ms. Bradford, in helping us get this completed. And so um, we're just uh, uh, happy that uh, you all have a annual audit report that shows the progress we're making here in the county. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks again, Ms. Robinson. You take care. All right, um, Board of Commissioners and Mr. Jones, everybody, y'all need to pat your hand, steps on the back with this. This really speaks volumes. It, it really does uh, about how we are taking care of the business of Warren County. It really is. So, with that said, uh, we'll move right along to um, citizens' comments, which is item number four, Board of Commissioners, and Miss Put. Okay, so we're going to do um, the the uh, the ones that we're sending in. If you don't mind reading those, and then we'll do the in-house ones. Okay, the first one is from Felicia Alston Singleton. I am writing to strongly urge you to review Warren County hazard pay employee list for your essential frontline workers. The hazardous pay policy clearly give descriptions and examples stating who and what determine departments are eligible. According to your tier one descri description of sheriff office are included. However, on the draft, the Warren County detention officers are classified as a tier two. Are they not part of the sheriff's office? Administrators are classified as tier two on the policy. On the draft, they are a tier one. There is no mention of the 911 dispatchers. Aren't they part of the sheriff's office and are essential workers to dispatch the calls of residents that need help, assistance from deputies or officers? I'm asking for more clarification on the hazardous pay policy. During this difficult and uncertain pandemic, the frontline essential workers risk not only their lives, <clears throat> but the lives, but their loved ones' lives every day, and Warren County owes them a tremendous debt of gratitude. The county received $4.1 million from the CRF last year. To still not compensated your employees, where is the compassion? Such behavior can be classified as egregious. <laughs> Next, this is from Shaniqua Jones. Good evening. I would like to know, are the commissioners trying to work with the mayor and council on bringing a grocery store to Warrington? It is a hardship for some residents to go to other cities to shop, especially dealing with restrictions during the pandemic. The economic development team or committee should be trying hard to bring in the developers. And if the city is not doing that, then the county should be concerned about their constituents. I asked about 10 people, do they know who their county executive or manager or the commissioners are? And they had no clue. Community engagement is extremely important. The needs of the resident of the county should be number one priority. The first step is make sure a supermarket is brought in to service their needs. That's it? Okay. Mr. Austin, five minutes, please. you, I'm sorry, my name is Milo Austin. I'm before you again um, to ask this board 
to consider to uh, stop the work on the Courthouse Square Memorial Committee due to the pandemic. I think everybody that spoke tonight, I've heard them mention the pandemic. And, that's, and that has been the reason that I have been here um, for the past five months, asking that. But what I really want to do tonight is talk about some of the questions that I had from the last meeting. And um, first question was, <clears throat> on what basis did Commissioner Hunt make such a motion not being an agenda item at the August 3rd meeting? What inspired this idea? Part of the answer looked like his motion to create Courthouse Square Committee. The rest of the response, creation of the Courthouse Square Memorial Committee was item 10 on the August 3rd agenda. But when I looked at item 10 on the August 3rd agenda, it has besides um, item 10, board committee commissioners dash. Vacancies were advertised July 3rd in the Warren Record and July 10 in the Littleton newspaper. I'm sorry, Lake Gaston newspaper. Now, and, and um, I A was creation of Courthouse Square Memorial Committee. Should have 11 appointed members. How did this make it on the agenda on the third? When it was also proved on the third, was, these are minutes from the third meeting. During the August third board of commissioner meetings, motion made by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Baker, board approved it to create the 11 member courthouse square committee. So really, I, I, I really want some clarity on that. How can it be on the agenda and but it was already proved for? It? I mean, it had to be true before to be on the agenda. On the agenda. So, are we having meetings before the meetings? And the next question: How were the interested members identified and so readily available on August third? Commissioner meeting at large members in particular. Response: The members appointed were not present at the August third meeting. Now, if they were not present at the August 3rd meeting, again, minutes from the August 3rd, August 3rd meeting, commissioners identified and appointed interested community members. So really, how can that happen? And I understand y'all don't answer questions now, but um, think about it. That sounds like some stuff that's kind of not right to me. Because if somebody could, explain something to me that I'm missing, I mean, great. My next question for, next, for the next meeting will be, two minute pieces of paper. Uh, oh. For the record, uh, Ms. Plutter, I'm gonna give him an extra minute because the mic was messed up, okay? When he first got up there. So I'm gonna give him an extra minute. Okay, I'm sorry. The questions for this meeting are, uh, thank you so much. Um, who made the Courthouse Square Committee project an agenda item at the August 3rd meeting? And we would love to have a commissioner's name. Or what interested citizen or group requested that it be on the agenda? Next question, what are the dates that the at-large members were asked to serve on the committee and dates that they accepted the appointment? Uh, people, this, this um, Courthouse Square Memorial Committee can be, it could be a very teachable thing at the right time. But people just really feel that this is not the, the right time for it. But the worst thing that can happen, that people are concerned about with the stuff I just asked tonight, the worst thing that can happen is that they feel like it's turning to something political. We do not need that. 
So we talked about transparency one time. Um, Mr. Chair, we would love if everything be transparent with this. And also, citizens are concerned that they want this board to be a board for all citizens and not a few citizens of the county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Uh, make sure that your questions are given to our clerk to the board for a proper response. Ms. Puller? Mr. Hicks? You have five minutes, sir. Thank you, it won't be long. Good evening to everybody. Um, I have a question, and this may be considered old. Um, the last meeting that I attended, the board voted to increase the installation fees for county water connection. And my question is, why is the county charging to install a water connection for uh, county water access. And the reason why I ask that is because generally uh, at your home, if you build a house, whatever, um, you generally do not pay for utility connections, such as lights, telephone service, things like that. They don't charge you a fee, they may charge you a um, deposit, but being as though these, the facility that's been, the, the equipment that's being installed is not being purchased by the county citizens. And from day one, as soon as the water is turned on, the county from that point until it is cut off is collecting from the citizens in the county. So my question is, why does the county charge to install when in actuality, the citizens are patronizing the service that the county renders. Um, and um, that's, that, that was a question of mine, but uh, I didn't know that that was being entertained when I was at the meeting. So I didn't sign up to speak or anything. You all handle business. And I'm late getting here because I think there was a couple of meetings ago, something to that effect. Um, and so my question is, what is the likelihood that that could be revisited, reconsidered in the best interest of the citizens of Warren County? And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, sir. Please make sure that your uh, question is submitted to our clerk to the board so you can have, receive a proper response. Thank you, sir. Ms. Pulley? Thank you. Thank you for the citizen comment. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, we are uh, entertaining uh, item number five, which is our consent agenda. The board will entertain a motion to for approval. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda. It's been properly motion by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Powell, that we approve our consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hear none, all in favor say aye. Opposed nay, motion is carried. Item number six, which is the uh, county manager's update. Mr. Jones, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, this evening, we have a few items for you. And the first one will be an update from Dr. Brake um, with our um, pandemic update. Good to see you, Dr. Brake. All right. First, I'd like to say good evening to everyone. <clears throat> and I'm here to give a COVID update. And tonight, I just wanted to give a brief update about our cases um, and our case counts and to give an update on our vaccination efforts here in the county. Okay. All right, so our COVID cases, um, Actually, our total number of cases is 1,614. 
And since I last gave an update, we are starting to see some decreases in the number of active cases that we have in the county. We currently have 49 active cases, and this is as of this afternoon. We have 1,547 recovered cases, two individuals that are in the hospital, and we have 18 deaths. So we actually have seen an increase in deaths, I think by three, um, since I last gave this update. And one thing I will say is that those individuals that um, have passed and were hospitalized are ones that have really severe um, illness. So they have complications and um, from COVID, but also comorbidities as well. So these were um, very sick individuals. <clears throat> And we certainly um, send our prayers and condolences to their families. Okay, for the COVID-19 vaccination update, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the administration of the vaccine and how that has um, been going in our county. Um, currently, Warren County residents um, that have been administered the vaccine is a little over 4,000. So it's 4,271. We um, have the Moderna vaccine in Warren County, which of course is two doses um, given at least 28 days apart. The number of first doses administered is 3,261 and the number of second doses administered is 1,010. I also wanted to share that on Friday, we learned that North Carolina was ranked number one in vaccinating seniors 65 years and older by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And these were um, adults in North Carolina, 65 and older, who had received at least one dose of the vaccine in North Carolina. So North Carolina has um, vaccinated of uh, 49%. In Warren County, out of our uh, first dose administered, 66% of those were given to seniors. I wanted to share that our, last time I talked about our priority groups, um, there are five groups that the state has designated um, priority for vaccinations. The first one is healthcare workers and long-term care staff and residents. The second is older adults. The third is frontline essential workers. The fourth group is adults at high risk for exposure and, and increased risk of severe illness. And then group five, of course, is anyone else who would like to get the vaccine. We are currently um, vaccinating folks in the first two phases, the healthcare workers, long-term care facilities, and seniors who are 65 and older. The update to the priority groups is that on uh, February 11th, the governor designated school and child care center staff that they would become eligible for the vaccine on February the 24th. Also, the frontline essential workers, which is group three, that group was deemed eligible to start receiving the vaccine on March 10th. Um, so our vaccination clinics are scheduled by appointments and we are working um, to get these groups and preparing for frontline essential workers within the next week. I also wanted to just give an update on our um, enrolled providers. Um, I think I mentioned a few last time, but those that actually have the vaccine in Warren County are uh, Beckford Warren Medical Center, Futrell Pharmacy and Walgreens. So we still have two that have not yet received the vaccine. And that is Hope Regional Medical Clinic and Rural Health Group of Norlina. Okay, and I think one of my slides um, was slipped, but I'll just go back to it because I wanted to note that um, in talking about the current priority groups, um, the frontline essential workers is a large group, so I know there have been a lot of questions about who is in the group, um, but I just want to say that in general, it includes manufacturing, education. So right now we're looking at pre-K through um, 
through 12, but it also includes colleges and university staff and faculty. It includes essential goods businesses like grocery stores and pharmacies. It also includes food and agriculture. So that's our farm workers, um, our migrant farmers, meat packing companies, food processing, restaurant workers. It also includes other healthcare and public health workers, which includes um, social workers as well. Also in this group are government and community services workers. So these include our um, US postal workers. I know there was a question about that. Um, and any shipping workers, but it also includes our courthouse staff, elected officials. It also includes clergy, um, veterinarians and their staff, students, um, those who work in homeless shelters. So government and community service is a large group. And then also public safety, which includes our fire, EMS, law enforcement, correction staff, security officers, and any public health agency that respond to abuse and neglect. And then the last category is transportation. So that includes public transit, um, DMV workers, um, maintenance, repair technicians, all of those kinds of professions. So we see group three is gonna be a large group. And so we're excited to have um, a number of providers that will be able to help vaccinate this group. Okay, and so um, my last slide really deals with transportation. I did announce last time that CARTS was responding to a request from the state um, to get some funding to be able to provide transportation to those individuals who are in need of transit to get to their COVID-19 vaccine appointments. So I'm happy to say that those services are in place. They are active. We are um, seeing patients being transported, not only to the health department, but transported to any vaccine appointment that they have. And it also allows them to have their caregiver to come along with them as well. So if someone needs transportation to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, they can do one or two things. If they're 60 years of age or older and they're Warren County resident, they can call the Warren County Senior Center. And that number is 257-3111. And the Senior Center will help schedule those appointments for residents that are 60 years of age and older. Everyone else can call CARTS quickly. Um, and so as soon as the appointment is set, um, individuals can call the Senior Center or they can call CARTS at 438-2573 to schedule their appointment. And those are all the updates that I have. I'm happy to entertain any questions at this time. Okay, Board of Commissioners. Dr. Brake, um, yes. I'm gonna make some comments, but if I, if I say something incorrectly, I want you to correct me uh, in real time. Okay. Um, it has been, uh, I guess, through my um, um, engagement in the COVID-19 as far as the, the vaccine rollout, to my understanding, there is a um, gap or a lack thereof of the minority community actually getting the vaccine, especially uh, in regards to young black men or males getting the vaccine. Is that correct? Um, well, the gap is basically being addressed in terms of um, looking at vaccine equity, and that is assuring that everyone has equal access to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about equity, we are usually looking at populations that are historically marginalized, which means that they not only have not had access to vaccines, but to other health services as well. And typically those include individuals that are in rural areas, it includes African-Americans, Native Americans, as well as Hispanic populations. So Warren County has been um, tasked by the state to make sure that we are addressing equity in Warren County. And that means if, and I'll use African-Americans as an example, if 50% of our population is African-American, our vaccine rate should be similar to that. So whatever your population rate is, your vaccination rate should reflect your population. Um, and so that is something that um, all the providers have been working on to try to ensure that there is equitable access. 
Um, and I do know that um, probably about two weeks ago, our rates of vaccination among African Americans was about 40%. Now it's about 56%, not quite 50%. But 49, 47%. So the county is making progress in just reaching out to all populations. I think because we're rural, it kind of puts us at a disadvantage in many ways because people don't have access. So that's why transportation is important. But I would say that we are all kind of working on all of those equity issues Thank within you. the county. And I just want to go on record that, you know, not making a judgment call for anyone. They, of course, it's their own right whether they decide to take the vaccine or not. But I have taken, I've got my first dose and waiting for my second one. And um, it just hopefully that if that be the case, that I can inspire. And, I, and I'm sure that the other Board of Commissioners here, because I know Ms. Baker's, she's had hers. Is that right, Ms. Baker? It's okay for me to say that. I don't say it now. She, she doesn't have both of hers and Mr. Powell, I think, I don't know, but uh, Mr. Hunt. Okay. All right. So we got some sign up forms here to the page. No. So what, uh, you, you haven't reached age limit yet? Yeah, I'm not in that part. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I just want to, I, I don't mean to put nobody on the spot, but is, if we can say something, and I can say something to encourage people to, 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 to get the vaccine and to basically make sure we have a healthy community, then that's what we are tasked to do. And that's, and that's my whole point tonight is that, hey, look, uh, do your research, come up with your, your own plan of action, and if it fits for you, get the vaccine, get the vaccine. Because I, one law, one life loss is enough for me. So that's how I look at it. The other point that I want to make that um, I, I believe that Walgreens here will give the vaccine to 16 year olds of older. Is that correct? I don't know that they're giving them to 16 year olds. Um, basically, all the enrolled providers are following the state guidance. So okay. whether it's Walgreens or any of the other healthcare providers, we're all following the priority group. So we're all vaccinating group one, group two, and starting now with school um, and child care staff. Well, I don't know if I want to get anybody in the trouble, but uh, uh, just a Good chance if you're 16 years of age or older, you can you can get your vaccine at the Walgreens here. So, and I will say that Walgreens is under the federal program, so they're not under DHHS as right. we all are. Exactly, they are under the federal um, vaccination program, and so right. they may do a little bit different, but actually they are still under following the the priority groups of the state. All right, so okay. Um, before we conclude, anybody else got anything else? Uh, Commissioner Baker. No, ma'am, there is not. The actually CARTS gets reimbursed from the state for providing the service. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Bray. Um, Mr. Jones, do you have anything else before we conclude? Sure, I have two additional items. Oh, I'm talking about for Dr. Brake. I'm sorry. <laughs> I won't try to leave you out. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you again, Dr. Brake, and, and your staff, of, okay. of course. Can I just add one more comment? Because Please. You, um, when you talk about um, being an advocate, I will say that probably one of the um, best ways that we've learned that people decide to get the vaccine is really hearing from the, the people who have gotten it already. Um, that really makes a difference um, because if you're my neighbor or you're my family member and you got it and I know your experience, then that enlightens me a little bit more than just reading a news article or hearing something on TV. And I must say our seniors are rock stars. They really are. We've gotten great testimonies from seniors and they have been great advocates for people to get the vaccine. So word of mouth does work and it does help people understand about getting the vaccine. Well, that's true, because uh, the only thing that appeared to me about the vaccine was the needle. I, I don't like the needles. So, but uh, other than that, I was hoping they come in pill form. But anyway, <laughs> but hey, hey, it was no complications at all. I got my first dose, this little sore arm. But other than that, that was absolutely nothing. It felt really good. So it was Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Bray. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move right along and um, Continue on with, with our county manager, Mr. Jones. Sure. Thank
Thank you, Chair. Um, as you all know, on Friday, the governor's executive order um, started to loosen some restrictions that were in place uh, to help us safely navigate the pandemic. Um, I want to bring to your attention that the Recreation Commission at their last meeting did uh, support us reopening our sports programs with the Recreation Department. So as you know, recreation programming involving our sports that um, were considered uh, mass gatherings have been closed for, um, it'll be uh, almost a year at this point. And so we have put together a reopening plan um, that will safely allow us to begin to gauge um, the interests of our families and youth participating in sports. Um, it has been reviewed by our health department to make sure that we are putting the appropriate safety protocol in, in place. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention that uh, we will start to um, re-engage around our youth sports programming from the recreation department. Good job, thank you. And if there are no questions, I also would like to add, because of those restrictions that were eased um, as of Friday, we will also move forward with starting to rent this facility as a, a rental space. Um, so as you know, since the beginning of the fiscal year, we have not rented it out. And based on the restrictions, it can be rented at 30% capacity, which is, if I'm not mistaken, this pulley is 105 people. So we will require people to make sure that they have safety protocols in place and they can go up to that number to rent the arm. Did you say 105? Yes. Okay. Great. Any questions about either of those items? If not, I'll move on. The next item I have for you is uh, you have on your agenda this evening an update to our hazard pay policy. Um, we found some uh, items that we wanted to correct with the policy, and we wanted to bring those to your attention this evening, and we wanted to make a recommendation for you this evening. So as you know, there has been a list that was uh, released that talked about the employees who would be approved or recommended uh, in my recommendation to you for hazard pay. That list has been revised. And so now you will see that you have a total of 177 requests, 148 have been approved. And the approximate cost for that is $140,700. And so that leaves approximately 29 people who were not approved. Um, as you know, government is considered essential. All of us are considered essential employees. The hazard pay policy was put in place to try to address some of those of us who um, have a higher potential of being exposed based on their position and the duties that they have. And so what we also would like to propose to you is that uh, we have tier one and tier two, um, the group of 29, we could also create a tier three to allow them to receive hazard pay as well at a rate of $300. We just wanted to offer another option to let our employees know that we do value their service to the county. However, you know, there is not an opportunity for us to give everyone hazard pay. And so we wanted to make sure that we do, in fact, recognize those employees who do feel that they were eligible for, for hazard pay. Ms. Foster, would you mind coming up as well to help me with this? And one of the things I also, uh, my, my recommendation to you is we picked a specific period in the year um, that we have identified as our eligibility period. And that was March 30th of 2020 to July 31st of 2021. That was a period of time where we first reacted to the pandemic. Many of our employees were working alternate schedules, meaning many of them were either working from home or taking alternate days at home to remain safe. We provided everyone with um, personal protective equipment as well. But that being the case, again, some people have additional duties that would um, offer them uh, potential exposure. Ms. Foster, for those employees who were not eligible based on 
um, our policy. How many again was that? There were a total of 24 denials out of the 177 requests. Okay, and if we were to do a tier three at $300, what would that cost be? $7,200. So the total this evening when we get to that item would be um, $147,900. And that way everyone who um, submitted a request for hazard pay would receive uh, some level of allowance. Mr. Johnson, can you tell me what those departments are going to be added in? You can just give me the departments. Ms. Foster, can you, the ones who are in the revised list that were new that they may not have seen before? Mm -hmm. The In the revised list, uh, there were additional folks from DSS added and emergency services added, as well as from the Sheriff's Department and um, a last minute request from code enforcement. Okay, so basically it includes um, everyone on that list that you sent out, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay. Board of Commissioners, any questions? Mr. Jones, real quick, is it um, the supervisors who are making the requests or is it the individuals? How exactly are you guys getting the requests? Right, the department on? directors were to submit for their department for their employees. Hmm. We only had one uh, indication that someone uh, was not able to get that request in, but we were able to make that adjustment today. Okay. Sure. Okay. So I guess what this is for approval later on in the agenda, exactly. correct? I just want to provide you an overview now and right. uh, we will revisit it when that comes up. Right. I, I, of course, I echo that we do value uh, every uh, employee and their contribution to keeping us safe and um, keeping the county moving. So, uh, Mr. Jones, appreciate your efforts to uh, make this recommendation to, to us and Ms. Beverly. Thank you. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, we will entertain item number seven, Mr. Faines, our finance director. And Mr. Faines, while you're coming up, um, you can tell us that the twins are doing wonderful. Okay, <laughs> that's the, you're on your job then, you're on your job. Mr. Fans, I would like to, uh, uh, to basically, before you begin, just open up the floor to the Board of Commissioners as they can see that what your request is on the item number 10, I mean, amendment number 10, um, that Board of Commissioners, if there's something in particular that you would like to ask Mr. Fames about, then I'll open up the floor for you to do so, and then we'll proceed to approving uh, his request. Any questions, concerns from the Board of Commissioners? Okay, Mr. Faint, I don't know how you do it, but you do it. So I <laughs> and I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen of the board, unless you have something from Mr. Faint, I entertain a motion from the board to approve his request of amendment number 10 to the fiscal year 21 budget ordinance. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve agenda item seven as presented by finance officer, director. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Powell, that we approve item number seven, which is amendment number 10 to the fiscal year 21 budget as presented by finance director, Ms. Lee Fames. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 
Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, Mr. Fain. Thank you, y'all. Y'all have a great evening. Do the same, sir. All right, item number eight, consider approval of DSS child support office lease at a rate of 34668 per year for three years and authorize the county managers to execute this. This was on our prior, prior work session, Mr. Jones, is that correct? Or was it, I can't remember, I'm sorry, but I think it was on there. And I think one of the conditions was we were able to opt out of it. And I think that you're taking care of that. And I think they've got, what, six days, if that be the case, right? Absolutely. So I entertain a motion for approval. I'm sorry, I missed what you just said at the end. The opt out, what did you say? Yeah, Mr. James was Mr. Jones was able to add to the contract that if in the next three years of this contract, if we decide to move out, we have to give them sixty days and we can we can basically opt out of this contract. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. In, in actuality, it was already in the- Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, right. I was giving but you that credit. We, we, but we did adjust the lease term okay. from five years to three years. Okay, okay, thank you. Did, did you ever get a, uh, um, we're gonna move it back to the actual date. I know it's 2020. Yes, uh, County Attorney Kingsbury said we could just uh, back it to July 1. July 1, okay, good deal, thank you. So I entertain a motion from the board. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve um, DSS child support office lease at a rate of $34,668 per year for three years and authorize the county manager to execute. It's been proper motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Baker, that we uh, approve item eight as presented and stated. Is there any further discussion? Just one quick note, I just want to say, yes. I know that we get reimbursed for like 50% comes back from the state or something like that. We get part of it coming back, but hopefully, you know, when we do our facilities overview and inspections and checks and go back through all of that, that we'll be able to use actually some county home building to house this unit. That's all. Yes, ma'am. And I think that was the um, intent behind lessening the five years Period. Okay. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. Thank you. Item number nine this is consider the uh, hazard pay policy updated and um, update and payment recommendation by Mr. Jones. Um, Thank you. Sir? I'm sorry. I thought you'd already uh, were addressing me. I apologize. Uh, uh, actually, I am. <laughs> <laughs> So we have two items for your approval this evening. The first is an update to the policy. So in your packet, you will see, we try to identify where we are making changes. So where there is a strike through, there's language that we have revised. Um, where you see underline is where we have um, added some language. So I'm gonna have Ms. Foster help me with that in case I missed something. Um, so in the scope of the project, as well as in eligibility, we use the term um, in the field, and I think that is a dated term, and so we wanted to change that. And mm -hmm. so that has been changed to say outside an office. Gotcha. Right. Um, we have used that in the policy twice, uh, like I said, in the scope as well as in um, uh, the eligibility for hazard pay policy. In the eligibility section, section B, you will see where we have added some language in B1 and B6. B1, we talked about employees who are teleworking or using staggered schedules, or in our final review last week, we realized that some of our um, employees who actually were working staggered, staggered schedules were eligible because they were participating in duties that um, could potentially expose them to the virus. And so we added language that says, um, employees who are teleworking and are using staggered schedules or not in public facing emergency related public health response work when in the office. So that means if they were in the office, they were doing things that could have uh, exposed them. Number six, we added, it says employees not currently employed by the county during the payout period. In the guideline sections, uh, we added language that says um, employees will be considered for hazard pay. 
And then here we talk about the recommendation that's going to come before you this evening because it's a different amount than we originally talked about. You will see that the percentage amount between full time and part time was changed from 25% to 50%. And those are all the changes that we have made to the policy. So we're asking for your approval this evening of the updated uh, policy. Um, and that will allow us to uh, move forward um, with the recommendations that I mentioned uh, uh, previous, previously. And we can add that third tier as well. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, we're gonna entertain the request by the county manager on the 9A and the um, modification of addition to uh, stated in tier three. So I entertain a motion for the board of approval or there be questions for the county manager. Mr. Jones, uh, I, I do have one question. Sure. Um, would there be another opportunity if we see fit going forward that we may have to do this again? Sure. So um, the way our policy is, is set up, if, if we're under this uh, declared emergency and we see another opportunity to um, bring a recommendation forward to you, then we can do it. Policy just simply allows us the um, direction or guidance we need to get to bring this to you. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Ladies and gentlemen of the board. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the hazard pay policy uh, as revised. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Powell, that we approve 9A as uh, presented and revised and stated. Is there any further discussion? Here not all in favor say aye. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. Mr. Jones. All right. Uh, I will let Ms. Uh, Foster help out with the next item that has great recommendations. So in your packets, you have a list of approvals. And like Mr. Jones said, this was revised today. Um, all the departments are lifted, listed here with their positions and what it would cost the county to do. Um, of the 177 requests we received, 148 of them were approved, and that's about an 84% approval rate. So that's something we're extremely proud of based on the requests we received. You also have in your packet a one pager that lists the cost here. So as Mr. James mentioned earlier, the total cost of all of these approvals we're recommending to you today is $140,700. And if we add the, the tier three that we talked about, it would add that additional amount as well. Yes, so if we did add that additional tier three, there would be 24 individuals eligible under the policy for that that were requested based on their time of employment with that clause now added and approved at $300 that would be an additional $7,200 so with the total of $147,000 $147,900 okay I just want to get a little bit of clarification um so that that includes uh I think request from the uh the, uh, or the recommendation, so to speak, that the, uh, I think that includes personnel from the sheriff's office, right? Yes, sir. The updated uh, request to you today, the recommendation does include all personnel from the sheriff's office. All right. So I won't ask a bunch of individual questions. Can you just state them for me, please? Yes, sir. So the sheriff, the deputies, the detention officers, E911 coordinator, E911 telecommunicators, and E911 senior telecommunicator, senior administrative assistant, administrative assistant one, and then part time administrative assistant. That's all the additions that we did today? I'm sorry. Is that the additions that we did today? Oh, the additions that we did uh, this week were sheriff, uh, E911, and the administrative staff. 
uh, for the whole recommendation, those additions. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, yes, is that, is that she, I just wanna make sure that we're responding to your. Yeah, I'm just talking about the, 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 the tier three recommendations. Does oh, that in, sorry. So that, so that wouldn't include, okay. Yeah, so the tier three recommendations, if we were to move through with that, would include veteran services, public utilities, public works, um, parks and rec, senior center, register of deeds, and register of deeds. All right, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. So, um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, that is a recommendation from the county manager and his staff under 9B. If there are any other questions, I uh, entertain a motion for approval. I do have another question. I'm just, I'm just since we've added the other tier. So for those departments, the only ones realistically that we're excluding are those that were entirely closed to the public. Is that what this is? Because in my thinking now, we're truly just going to be adding more on to it. Like for our public utilities, were they closed to the public or no, they were open to the public? They, they were closed to the public, but what they indicated when they applied to us was that they had some problematic cases that they still had to bring people in the office to assist them. Yeah, because my thinking now is, wouldn't the tax office almost be the same way? Isn't that office? Tax office. That, you know, now, I mean, if you're literally going to <laughs> open it up like this, everybody, you got county manager's office, did you completely close down or did people come in time to time? No, you guys we, were completely we, closed so down? that's a good, but we did not close. And so here's the, here's the thing, Commissioner, we know that this is not going to be perfect. And so we have tried to make sure that we are addressing those folk who um, are providing direct service to our residents. The tax office was closed. They were, they were closed to the public. They were using drop boxes, et cetera. Um, and so those offices didn't even apply because they read the policy and interpreted it based on the, the period that we identified. And so they didn't even apply. And so we're addressing those folk um, who apply. Um, and so, um, yes. Okay. All right. If it works for you, yeah, if it works for you guys, it works for me. So good enough. All right. But I would like to say we did have safety protocol in place. We tried our best to make sure employees felt like they were comfortable, that we gave them PPE, that they had the ability to social distance when they were in their offices. It's not going to be perfect, um, but um, we're, we're trying to just address those and let people know that we do appreciate their service because Absolutely. we were able to stay open um, the whole period. Okay. Um, sure. Thank you. The, the corporate extension, did they not apply? Right. They did not. Okay. Give, given the, the circumstances now, will, will they have an option to? apply or to appeal or yes they 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 would have an opportunity to apply okay miss miss did you say recreation she did say recreation So, so the, our facilities were open, the recreation complex was open, for example. Um, and the reason that they applied was because of using, cleaning the restrooms that were possibly the exposure opportunities for the virus. I can't even remember, did I get a, uh, a motion? <laughs> did we get a, we didn't get a motion before, did we? I entertain a motion for approval. Um, let's see. So we're, this is what, number C? What are we doing? 9B, 9B. 
Okay, so it is my, um, I make the motion that we go with the hazard pay recommendation that was presented um, before us with an approximate cost of $140,000, $140,700. That was right. Yes. One forty-seven. One forty-seven. One forty-seven. With the added tier three, it would be that number. Yes. Maybe. With the addition of tier three, so one hundred forty-seven thousand nine hundred dollars with the addition of tier three, and this is coming out of what funding? That is tier. Yes. Yeah. This is what everything. This is everything. Yeah the entire it's here one through three at a cost of $147,900. It'll come out of the miscellaneous savings that you have identified this evening in the uh, budget. And coming out of the miscellaneous savings previously identified. Thank you. Sir. It's been properly motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Hunt, and we approve 9B as stated and revised. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Beverly, for helping us through that. And Mr. Jones. All right, moving on to item number 10, which is consider approval of recreation bids of Marinoia or Ernest uh, Recreation Park using 297-540 part of funding. And I will turn it over to Mr. Jones. Sure, thank you, Chair. This has been an item that we have been working on for a while. I have Mr. McConnell here this evening. Um, before he gets started, I would like to say um, that we are going to take off two items uh, okay. from the list, the picnic shelter and the bathhouse. Um, we um, are going to do some additional work. Uh, a big portion of those projects has to do with the roofing. And we just want to make sure that we get the right product and uh, uh, specifications right for those two projects. So we'll bring those back to you at a later time. Okay. Mr. McConnell, can you provide an update of the remaining projects, the basketball court renovations and the tennis court renovations? Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Can everybody hear me good? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, so with the With the part of grant, we had a February 11th meeting with the uh, Recreation Commission, and they adopted this plan as presented. Um, this is for the picnic shelter, I mean, not the picnic shelter, the basketball court and the tennis courts. Um, the tennis court size is uh, 156 wide by 120 long, and the basketball court is 115 long by 130 wide. Um, so the basketball court is gonna be a complete teardown and they're gonna rebuild it. Mm. The project is broken up into two different prices here. You can see uh, Wright Meyer Machine is doing the basketball asphalt only. And then North State is going to do the resurfacing and to add the goals to that and paint all the lines and stuff. So for the tennis court, North State is doing the tennis court. That's going to be a repair. They're going to clean it and do a repair and then a resurfacing. Um, the total cost for that project was 116664 for the basketball court and 35135 for the tennis courts. So that's a total project of 151799. So we had budgets already set for that through the part of grant. The repair for the tennis court was 35,000, so it came in right on that. And the basketball court came in a little bit higher. It was a 105 and we the bid was 116, but the recreation commission added, they wanted to add um, a fence around the perimeter of the basketball court and an optional polyester system that gives us like three years extra warranty. And let me see here. 
Oh, and one extra. The 11,710 was for Wright Meyer. They're going to add one inch extra asphalt for a total of three inches thick. Okay. Are there any questions? We good? Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any questions. I think I think it's outstanding that this work is getting done. So I will entertain a motion to approve. Item 10, subsections two and three. Is that right, Mr. Jones? Chair, I'm sorry, I, did, I missed uh, okay. your question. Uh, this is gonna be a motion to approve item number 10, subsections uh, two and three. Yes, sir, that, that's correct. Okay, so I entertain a motion for, uh, for that, please. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve Basketball court renovation and the tennis court resurfacing as presented. It's been proper motion by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Baker, that we approve item number 10, uh, subsection two and three, which is the basketball court renovation and the tennis, tennis courts uh, resurfacing. Is there any further discussion? I just got another question, or a question for Mr. McConnell. Okay. What's the timeline of this? The timeline? Yeah, what's the time? Yeah. Okay, so um, with the asphalt and stuff, mm -hmm. that last year it gets, it has to get to a certain temperature before they can start doing the asphalt work. Um, they can start doing the demolition. Uh, we would hope to get that done pretty soon. Uh, the, the part of grant money, has to be spent, I believe, by next year. I'm not sure on the exact date of that, but it's a three-year process, and I believe we're on year two of that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe by the summer, this will be done, right? Two and three. Is that the plan, by the summer? That's and so right. let's go back to one and four real quick. So I know you're taking it back because there's some additional work that needs to be done. When do you expect to have that proposal in so they can go out for, I guess, rebid? Is it going to be rebid? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. For um, items one and four, the picnic shelter and the bathhouse with the yeah. additional, are you guys going to take it back out to rebid? Uh, no, we, we were just looking at getting some clarification. We had some mix ups on like the, the metal roofing. Mm -hmm. There's, um, what they were bid for. There's two different types of metal roofing that we're looking at, and we're just looking at what's going to be our best option. Okay. So we're just in the, in the process of just getting a couple more, like just finding out what the difference in the two prices are. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Did you have something to say? No, no. Ready to go. Okay. All right. All the. I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Jones? So Chair, so Chair I just want to add, um, Mr. McConnell mentioned the additional work that the Recreation Commission recommended. And so um, that just means that the county really is going to have to uh, bear those costs. And so he mentioned that there was a budget for the part of grant. And so we are just assuming the additional costs that were recommended by the Recreation Commission. Just want to be clear about that. Is that over and beyond what we had budgeted or the match? Ultimately, it will end up that way. Okay. Yeah. Which, so, which we will address in the next budget going forward. Right. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jones. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna deal with item number 11, which is the appointments to the board of, uh, to the board of committees and commissions. And we're gonna deal with 11A, which is consider appointments or reappointments to making fire district tax board for a three year term. And we have uh, a reappointment of M.E. Turner, uh, T.P. Wagner, and P.T. Height, and appointment of Gladys Durham and Thomas Roth. So I entertain a, a motion, the board entertain a motion for approval for 11A. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve agenda item 11A as presented. Then proper as motion by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Powell, that we approve 11A as presented and stated. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed nay, motion carried. 11B, which is consider approval appointments to the North Island Volunteer Fire Department Tax Board, which is Stephanie Acock. Um, let me get some clarification here. Mr. Kingsbury, can I do 11B as stated or I, these have different terms? So can I say as stated or I gotta go individual? As stated. Thank you, sir. All right, so we have Stephanie Acock, three-year term, Robert Newell, two-year term, Danny Owen, one-year term, Amy Barber, three-year term, and Anthony Tyler for a two-year term. I entertain our motion for approval for 11B. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve agenda item 11B as presented. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Baker, that we approve 11B as stated and presented. Is there any further discussion? Hear none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay, motion carried. Item 11C, consider approval of reappointments to the Recreation Commission. We have Mr. Tyron Sims. Help me out, Mr. John. I mean, Mr. Who's that? It's on at the... I don't want to pronounce that wrong. Is that Abdeen? Ms. Abdeen, all right. Um, Mr. Espinosa and Mr. Calvin Boyd. I entertain a motion for approval for 11C. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve agenda item 11C in accordance to direct bylaws. Okay. That's to stipulate the terms, they're not yep. here, so. Yes, sir, I understand. Look for a second. I can hear. I can second that. Okay. You okay? But I do have a question. You got it. In regards, because like the rest of our, you know, appointments, they'll say what the term limits are or what term they're serving. Is there any reason why this wasn't included or wasn't requested? It just, you know, was standard for us to show. You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, I mean, for me, I didn't pick up on it until you just said it. So, I mean, I'll yield to the county manager or the, uh, I don't know. I, I can't. What? Right. He said according to the board guidelines. You're right. He did say that. No, no that, that's really not made that clarification. And I think these are three year terms. And I don't know whether it's first, second, or third term. Yeah. But but that's the reason we, I said according to the bylaws or the, yeah, okay. it, it specifies it. So, so should we go ahead and reappoint these people because we don't have their term limits in front of us or should we? But all of them are in compliance. They are? They are in compliance. Okay. So that's fine, Ms. Um, Pulley, when you're doing the minutes, I guess, if you're able to include what term they're on, would that be possible? Okay, that'll work. All right, um, so it's been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Pierce, that we approve 11C as stated and presented with the um, added uh, verbiage there. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
Opposed nay, motion is carried. Item 11D, consider approval of appointment of uh, Candace White to the Warren County Board of Health uh, as recommended. I enter, the board will entertain a motion for approval. It's been proper motion by Commissioner Baker, second by Commissioner Hunt, that we will approve 11D as stated and presented. Is there any um, discussion? Hear none, all in favor say aye. Opposed nay, motion is carried. Item number 12 is to consider occupancy tax draft legislation and this is presented by our county attorney, Mr. Hassan Kingsbury. Mr. Kingsbury, and I'm sorry, uh, EDC Director Michelle Duncan. So I will yield to our County Attorney, Mr. Kingsbury. Thank you, Board Chair. Um, I don't want to uh, neglect the memo that Ms. Duncan put together, but um, in a nutshell, our County Administration has been working with Representative Garrison on uh, introducing legislation to the North Carolina General Assembly that will allow us to collect an occupancy tax. As you know, that has to come through the General Assembly. And so there is a bill that was drafted on our behalf and myself, County Manager Jones, and uh, Ms. Duncan put our eyes on it. And we uh, were asked to come up with a proposed rate to collect our occupancy tax at. And we looked in the surrounding counties and we thought that 5% would be most competitive for us and the best thing to do. So we are asking for your support. Um, after this legislation goes through the General Assembly, um, it would allow us to um, establish a TDA, a Tourism Development Authority, which will be in charge of administering those funds. So we look forward to um, this bill passing and um, to receive some um, occupancy tax revenue for Warren County as we establish hotels and other industry here. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Ms. Duncan, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, not unless you have any questions for me. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, any questions for our county attorney or Ms. Duncan? Thank y'all for taking care of this. So the board will entertain a motion for approval for item number 12. Is there a second? Sir. It's been properly motioned by Commissioner Baker, second by Commissioner Hunt, that we approve item number 12 as presented and stated by our county attorney and EDC director. Is there any further discussion? Hear none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed nay, motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Kingsbury and Ms. Duncan. Thank you. All right, item number 13. Uh, this is to consider approval of wa waiver of landfill tipping fee requested by Greenwood Baptist Church for disposal of construction debris. The amount of the waiver should be less than $200. I will entertain a motion for approval. Mr. Jones. Chair, thank you. And when you consider this, I think the language should be not to exceed. See, that's where I was sitting here. Okay. So. The amount of the waiver should not exceed $200. So the board will entertain a motion for that language for item number 13. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve agenda item 13 as presented with the noted amendment. Dear second. Been properly motioned by Commissioner Hunt, second by Commissioner Baker, that we approve item number 13 as presented and revised. Is there any further discussion?
to my understanding, we have for for nonprofits. Nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So we allow. So I'm clear. So we allow waivers for nonprofits to have a tipping fee. Wait, is it like once a year, once every few years? Because I'm sure, I don't really remember it so much either. I know we may do it if it's a fire, you know, catastrophic stuff, and, you know, things of that nature. I don't know, just general construction. So I just want to be clear. No, they, they had a, uh, they, the basement got flooded over there. The basement was flooded? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, it's just not a general tear down stuff. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And, and not to prolong it, but you know, we, we might want to establish some type of policy of guidelines for this mm -hmm. in the future. But because it's such a small amount, but I, I think it might be a good idea to consider that. Okay. Uh, you know, for the future. Yes, sir. All right. All in favor say aye. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. Thank you. We're going to start with um, number 14 of Board of County Commissioner updates. And we'll start with Commissioner Baker. All right. Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Commissioner Pierce. I don't have any updates. Commissioner Hunt. No updates at this time. Well, I have no updates, but the comment said, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board for your hard work and dedication to take care of the business of Warren County. Mr. Jones, your leadership and your staff leadership on doing what you're doing. And um, our county attorney, we haven't uh, been doing pretty good here, haven't we, lately? <laughs> and also to the, uh, the citizens out there and uh, being here and uh, being a part of this meeting. So we'll move right on to, um, we don't have a item number 15. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna move right on from that and we're gonna go to number 16, which the board will entertain a motion that we adjourn our March 1st, 2021 board meeting. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn our March 1st, 2021 board meeting. It's been proper motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Powell that we adjourn. And we are here by adjourned.